In this video, we are going to go in depth with Dreamcast emulation on the Xbox Series X and S version of Retroarch. In the most recent builds of Retroarch, Dreamcast emulation is probably one of the most improved systems on the Xbox Series X and S. Previously, Flycast used an OpenGL renderer and would rely on Angle to run on the Xbox, which resulted in some performance issues in a number of titles. But now we have a proper Direct3D 11 renderer, and Dreamcast emulation is better than ever on Xbox consoles. And in this video, we're going to look at how to get it all set up. Now, before we begin, this guide is assuming that you have installed Retroarch using one of my provided methods. If not, check out the playlist link in the description to get set up on that. But anyway, let's dive in. Now, to get started with Flycast on the Xbox Series X and S, it is worth noting that a Dreamcast BIOS file is no longer required. Flycast has an HLE BIOS implementation that works really well, so if you don't have a Dreamcast BIOS, you don't have to scratch your head wondering where to get one. But for those of you that do have a Dreamcast BIOS and would like to have the Dreamcast boot animation, just make sure that it's named DC underscore boot dot bin. And then for anyone looking to get Naomi emulation set up, here's all the Naomi BIOS files that you need to find for that. We're not going to cover Naomi specifically in this video, but the information is here for you. But if you're curious about how to add those BIOS files to your Retroarch system folder, if you have an internal SSD installed, just go ahead and load up Durango FTP and start the server. Then on your PC or other computing device, access your FTP file share using your preferred method. Go into your local folder, find your Retroarch folder, local state, system, and once inside this folder, make a new folder and name it DC. Then you can open this one up and then get the Dreamcast BIOS that you've acquired and drag it right on in. Now, for those of you that have moved your system folder to USB, you can open that up, go to your created system folder, create a new folder, name it DC, open it up, and drag your Dreamcast BIOS file inside. And that is how you would add your Dreamcast BIOS file or Naomi BIOS files if you plan on doing Naomi stuff. Again, Naomi isn't specifically being covered in this video, but you'd put those BIOS files in here as well. Again, Dreamcast BIOS files are completely optional. You don't have to use them with Flycast. Flycast has an HLE BIOS file implementation to run games without it. But for anyone that might still happen to have a Dreamcast lying around and you want to dump your own BIOS file from it and any games that you might happen to own, I do have a guide on how to do so on the channel here and a link will be in the description below for that one. But with that optional BIOS file stuff out of the way, let's talk about Dreamcast games. There are a number of formats that Dreamcast games can come in. The most common you're going to find are CDI and GDI. While CDI works, if possible, get the original GDI files. These are the lossless versions compared to the compressed stuff people made to get Dreamcast games to run on bootleg CDs back in the day. Not all CDI files are bad, but you're guaranteed the best copies if you get a GDI file. Other formats include compression like Chud or even BinQ style, but I have my Dreamcast games separated into a couple different formats here. I have games that I've compressed previously into Chud format, and then I have my standard GDI files. So GDI files are kind of like a BinQ image. You have the GDI file here that tells where everything is in these separate bin and raw file formats. So they're not the prettiest things to look at, but within Retroarch, you can just load up the GDI file and the game will play. But if you want to save some space and kind of clean up your file system a bit, you can compress all of your GDI games into Chud format like I have out here. So I'll have a link in the description below where you could download this Q or GDI to Chud uh, zip file here. And once you get this downloaded, just go ahead and get it extracted. And you'll be left with a bat file and the Chudman executable. So just drag these into your Dreamcast image folder and run the bat file. And it will compress all of your GDI-based Dreamcast games into Chud format. And it will even search subfolders like this to find the GDI file. So you don't have to worry about pulling all of these things out of their subfolders. But process might take a bit, so just be patient with it and let it do its thing. And once the compression process is finished, you can just press any key on your keyboard to close out of that. And now we just have a nice selection of Dreamcast games all set and ready to go. 
All right, so now I'm just going to go ahead and delete all of the folders and stuff I don't need anymore. Shenmue is a multi-disc game, so I have it in its own folder, for those of you curious. But I'm actually going to do that for Resident Evil 2 and Code Veronica as well, so bear with me one second. All right, so I went ahead and got my multi-disc games all in their own separate subfolders. I just think it looks nicer, personally. You can organize your games however the frick you want. That's just my preference. But multi-disc games do require... Well, they don't require it, but another way to make them a little bit easier to work with in your playlists and things like that is to create M3U files for them. So an example of this, create a text file. Name it whatever you want. I'm just going to name it after the game here. Once the text file is created, open it up. And now we need to copy in the entire file name of each disk of our game. So if you have a four disk game, you copy all four file names. If you have a two disk game like Resident Evil here, you copy in just the two file names and so on and so forth. But you do want to make sure to grab the extension for that file name. So if for whatever reason you can't see the extensions on Windows, you can click on View and make sure the check mark here for file name extensions is checked. But once you have all of the disks entered into your new text file, go ahead and save it. And then we can close it. And we need to rename the extension from .txt to m3u. And it's going to give us a warning about it being a file extension change. That's great. We want to do it. Yay. There we go. That is one multi-disc game ready to go. I've already done that for Shenmue. So I'm just going to do it for Resident Evil 2 now. And now all of my multi-disc games are ready to go. I've made M3U files for them, so that way when I make a playlist within RetroArch, they can show up as a single game instead of having multiple entries. But now my games are all ready to go. They're in a smaller file size than a typical GDI file, so I just need to copy them onto my preferred storage medium for Xbox Series X and S. So I personally use my USB drive to play games with, so I'm just going to open up my games folder on my USB drive and drag my Dreamcast games folders folder on in. And there we go. That is now good to go for my USB install. For those of you that are running from the S drive, go back into your Durango FTP file share, access your S drive, program files, Windows apps, RetroArch folder with the X64 at the end, find your games folder, and then you could just drag your Dreamcast games right on in. But with these two steps out of the way, we are ready to begin loading up some Dreamcast games. Again, BIOS files are optional, so if you skip that step, you don't have to worry about it. But I'm just going to close out of everything on the PC side for the moment and move over to the Xbox. So now on our Xbox, I went ahead and got my USB drive reinserted, so booting into RetroArch. And from here, we're free to begin loading up Dreamcast content. So one method of doing so, go to the load content menu. Navigate to where you have your game stored. So for those of you on the internal SSD, go to S. Program files, Windows apps, find your RetroArch folder with the X64 at the end, find your games folder, find your Dreamcast games, select a game, choose a core, tell it to run. Or you might find them under the D drive, development files, Windows apps, RetroArch folder, games folder, choose a game, choose a core, tell it to run. If you're using USB under dev mode, that's typically found under E. Navigate to the games folder, find your Dreamcast games folder, choose a game, choose a core, tell it to run. And for retail mode users, your USB drives are typically under D. And then same process. Now, I personally don't care for this method, so I like to import my content and make a games playlist instead. Since we compressed our games into CHUD format, we will need to do a manual scan. And then choose your content directory. So navigate to that folder where your Dreamcast games are stored. So for me, it's under E, Games, Dreamcast Games, tell it to scan this directory. System name, press right on your D-pad to scroll down to Sega and find Dreamcast. And then for the default core, same thing, right on your D-pad to find the Sega section here. And find Sega-Dreamcast slash Naomi Flycast. Now, for this scan, I'm going to tell it to not scan recursively. That way, it doesn't scan those chud files of my multi-disc games. And I'm going to tell it to start the scan. Now that that scan's completed, I'm going to turn scan recursively back on, and I'm going to set a file extension of M3U. 
press start when that once that's entered. And I'm going to tell it to start the scan again. This way it will search within my subfolders specifically for M3U files for those multi-disc games. And once both of those scans have completed, I have my complete Dreamcast games list here on the left. And it looks awesome. And again, my multi-disc games are showing up as a single game file. Resident Evil Code Veronica, Resident Evil 2, and Shenmue. And now I could just go down to a game, select it, and tell it to run. And if you place the Dreamcast BIOS file within your system folder, you'll be greeted by the Dreamcast boot up animation. If not, it'll just jump straight into gameplay. Now, sometimes when you start up Dreamcast emulation under RetroArch for the first time, it likes to put things in Japanese for some reason. I'm not sure why. I, I dumped my BIOS file for my US region console, so it's just strange doesn't happen every time. It's like every other time I set up RetroArch, it decides to be Japanese for some reason, so it's really fun. But you can fix this by going into your RetroArch quick menu with your selected hotkey you set up during initial setup. Scroll down to options. Under system, you can change the region to whatever region you happen to be in. So I'm just going to set mine to US, and I'm going to set the language to English. That way I can just kind of uh, manually override that right there. But now that that's set, I'm just going to go ahead and close out of the content and restart it. So that way it will be in English and I can read it and understand what's happening. And there we go. It is all now in English again, so I can understand that I'm creating a new save file. Hooray. But there we go. Dreamcast games up and running on your Xbox Series X or S. And again, performance is just absolutely fantastic now. Really adoring playing Dreamcast games this way compared to a few of the last revisions, but... there's lots more to talk about when it comes to Dreamcast emulation, so let's go ahead and dive in. So going back into our RetroArch quick menu, the first thing I want to talk about is additional control settings for Dreamcast emulation. So if you scroll down here, there's a controls tab, then scroll down to port one controls, and under device type, you'll see that there are a number of things you can set here. So controllers, your standard uh, Dreamcast controller, arcade stick, keyboard, mouse, light gun, twin stick, Saturn twin stick. So unfortunately, mouse support is still not a thing in the Xbox version of RetroArch from my testing as of this video. But you can hook up a keyboard. So if you have a keyboard lying around and you plug it into your Xbox, you should be able to use it to play things like Typing of the Dead. So you can choose the keyboard option. Hit scroll lock on your keyboard to get game focus mode activated, and then you can use it like a real Dreamcast keyboard. And then for any games that have alternate controller setups after you're done setting it up, you can save that as a game remap file, so that way every time you load up that specific game, the controllers will be ready to go. You can also rearrange button mappings here as you please. Now the next thing I want to discuss is how to change discs in your multi-disc titles. So something like Shenmue, for example, I'm loaded into disc two right now, and if I tell it to start up a new game, it'll ask me to insert disc one. So to do this, just go into your RetroArch quick menu. And now we're gonna need to adjust some settings within the RetroArch main menu. So press B to go back out to the main menu here, go up to settings, and find the user interface tab. And from here, we need to disable pause content when menu is active, and I also just turn off pause content when not active. This way it will register our disk swaps. But once you have those set, you can go back up to the main menu, quick menu, and then I'm gonna save these as a core override so that way every time I load up a Dreamcast game, those options will be disabled for me. But now we're gonna head up to this option called disk control. And once inside, you can press A on eject disk. And you'll see that it takes you back to the Dreamcast menu if you have a BIOS uh, file installed. That's fine. That's how Dreamcast games work. They don't really dynamically swap disks, it seems. But if you press A on this new current disk index option that pops up after you eject the disk, you'll see all of the game files that you have listed within your M3U files. So I'm just going to change my disk over to Shenmue Disk 1 and tell it to insert the disk. And the quick menu will automatically close down, and I could press A on play, and it will load up into disc 1. And now when I tell it to start a new game, it loads up like it's supposed to, says, hey, we can't find a save file, we'll create a save file. But the game begins as intended. So just a quick recap again, press A on eject disc, 
open up the current disk index option, choose the disk you need to swap to, and press A on it and tell it to insert the disk. And then you can press play on the disk. Alright, but let's go ahead and talk about some of the advanced core options available to us within the Flycast core. So going back into our RetroArch quick menu, we're going to scroll back down to the options tab. So first up, let's check out the system tab again. So region and language, you saw how I use these to change it from Japanese to English earlier. Next up, we have the HLE BIOS option. So if you do happen to have a BIOS file placed in your system folder, you could force the HLE BIOS file to be used here by turning this option on. Next, we have boot to BIOS. If you want to boot into the Dreamcast BIOS instead of to into a game while you're playing, you could just turn this option on, close the content restart, and it'll boot into the BIOS. And then you can do whatever you need to do in there, turn this option off, and boot back into the game. I like using the disk control method instead. Go to disk control, eject your disk, it'll boot you to the BIOS, and then you can put the disk back in. I think that's a much easier method. Enable DSP, this is your sound emulation. If you don't want to have sound emulation, you can turn it off. Next up, we have Force Windows CE mode. This is useful for some homebrew stuff, but otherwise you won't be touching it. Next, video tab. First up, the internal resolution. You can adjust what resolution your Dreamcast games will be rendering at. Now, Dreamcast is pretty dang nice. You can crank this sucker up to a pretty high res with very minimal penalties, so go for that full 4K if that's your thing. Next up, cable type. This is actually... Um, a really useful option to know for specific games. If you want to have progressive scan on your games, you're going to want to set it to VGA. Not every Dreamcast game supported VGA output, so you're going to need to leave it on TV composite, or there are certain games that require to be set to TV RGB. So do be aware of that as you begin playing. Broadcast standard, probably want to leave this on NTSC. If you set it to one of the PAL regions, you're probably going to get reduced FPS. Screen orientation, this is for those games that uh, had tape mode there, so some of your vertical shooters. Flips the screen. Next up, alpha sorting, this is set to per triangle by default, and it's a good option. If you want a bit more accuracy, you could change it to per pixel, and you really shouldn't have too much of a performance hit, but do be aware it is a possibility. And if you set the per pixel option, it gives you an accumulation pixel buffer size, size selection here so you can set this up quite a bit next up enable rtt buffer go ahead and turn it on mint mapping leave on fog effects leave on volume modifier leave on and then next up we have anisotropic filtering so if you want to have slightly nicer textures you can crank that up to 16x next up delay frame swapping i don't typically turn this one on it can cause some uh, graphical glitches like you can see in the background here with tony hawk it kind of gets rid of things but the Power VR2 post-processing filter I like to turn on just as a little bit of an accuracy thing. Personal preference on this one, it's just a filter effect. It's not really necessary for the emulation. Next up is the performance tab. We're not really going to be messing with anything in here. But threaded rendering is on by default. Leave it on. And then we have frame skipping options. But if you're on Xbox Series X or S, you don't really need to mess with these. So bye frame skip. Next up, emulation hacks. Alright, so first up is widescreen cheats, and this will patch any supported game within the cheat database to output in an anamorphic widescreen format. Does require content restart if you plan on using it. Next is another widescreen hack that will attempt to play your games in widescreen. So for whatever reason this option doesn't work, you could try this one. But do be aware you can typically get culling in the areas outside the original 4x3 frame, so the first widescreen cheats one is definitely preferred over this widescreen hack. Next, GD-ROM fast loading. You can turn it on, eliminate load times on your games. I'm not sure about any incompatibilities with it on Flycast, so give it a shot, reduce your load times. If you get issues in certain games, you can turn it off for that specific game. And next, we have load custom textures. So for those of you interested in using HD texture packs or things like that on your Dreamcast games. Let's go over the setup process for this right now. So first of all, turn it on. And then you can just close out of any content you happen to be in. And we're just going to go ahead and close out of RetroArch. The next step, you need to download an HD texture pack for one of your Dreamcast titles. So I went ahead and downloaded a Crazy Taxi HD texture pack here from this Reddit thread. 
and it's not the most significant of changes when it comes to HD texture packs, but you can see that it does improve ground textures quite a bit. And uh, this wall texture looks nice enough. So went ahead and downloaded that, and when I extracted it, it came in a folder that was already named MK-51035. These texture packs should already be in folders named correctly for the game they need to be used for. Now we just need to add this into our RetroArch system slash DC folder, and I'll show you how to do that here real quick. So, quick note, if you are using a USB install, you do need to have a pretty fast USB drive for HD texture packs to work correctly. So, for example, my Western Digital Mechanical hard drive was not fast enough to use this crazy Taxi HD texture pack. It caused a lot of glitches and errors because it wasn't fast enough to load the textures in. But my PNY USB 3.0 USB flash drive was quick enough to do it, and my external SSD is fast enough to do it. So I switched over to my external SSD for this video just to demonstrate these HD texture packs. But anyway, system folder. If you made a DC folder earlier with your BIOS file, then you'll have a bunch of stuff in here. That's cool. If you didn't make a DC folder or place a BIOS file, this folder still would have been created for you automatically when you first loaded up a Dreamcast game. But inside this folder, we just need to make a new one and name it Textures. Then go ahead and open it up and place your HD texture pack within its named folder inside the Textures folder. And you're good to go for USB users. Cool. Now, if you're running your system folder from the Q drive or the S drive, just open up your Durango FTP server, start it up, and then access it from your computing device. Uh, navigate to your S drive or your local folder. Find your RetroArch folder. Your system folder, find that DC folder. And then same thing, new folder. Name it Textures. and then copy that texture pack inside and let it do its thing. And once that transfer is done, you're ready to begin playing that game with your new HD texture pack. So now you can see that I am playing Crazy Taxi with an HD texture pack installed. The widescreen code has automatically been applied and you can see that we just have a crap ton more screen real estate, all the while running at an internal resolution of nearly 4K and not a single performance dip in sight during the entire process. Quite fantastic, really. For those of you that uh, are into this sort of thing. I still prefer accuracy myself, but I mean, it's still super cool to see what these games could have been capable of, given uh, a few less limitations of the day. But it's really fun, if you press pause on Crazy Taxi, the frame buffer is still in native resolution, and you can see that the widescreen code doesn't apply anymore. So you can see that it just, uh, it's really funny. Anyway. But that's the process to getting custom textures up and running on Flycast. Again, if you're using USB, you will need a faster storage medium, otherwise you will encounter some glitches as it tries to load in the textures. Internal users, you have nothing to worry about. All right. Next up is the ability to dump textures from Dreamcast games. If you turn this option on as you play through a Dreamcast game, it will dump every texture that you see into that system folder, DC folder. And then you can pull them out, change them, put them into your textures folder, and have your own custom texture pack. All right, next up, input. Analog stick dead zones. You can manually adjust the dead zones on your Xbox controller for use in Dreamcast emulation. 15% is fine, I typically go down to 5 or 10 myself, but personal preference on how games and stuff feel to you here. Next, you can set the trigger dead zones. I leave this at zero myself. I don't really hit my triggers unintentionally, and they seem to work just fine. Digital triggers, this is great for fighting games. It makes it so there's no analog range in the triggers. Just pressing it activates it, so great option for fighting game fans or shooters. Next up, rumble packs. You can turn this on or off if you don't want rumble. You can turn it off if you want it on, you can turn it on. And then we have a number of crosshair displays. We don't have access to light gun stuff, so we can just ignore that. And finally, our last options to look at here are for our Dreamcast VMUs. So the first option is to set a per game VMU. I like to set this option. That way you don't have to worry about managing VMU storage space. So there's a number of options in here that make it really convenient. You can make 
a standalone VMU just for slot one or for all four VMUs in your Dreamcast emulation. I like to set this to just slot one, and if there's any games that might be able to share saves between them, you could save them into slot two, three, or four and access them from the other games. Next, we can turn on a VMU screen display for our emulated VMU, and then when we restart our emulation, there'll be a nice little VMU screen up in the upper left by default. You can change where it appears. And then you can adjust the size. I like to crank it up to 2x. It's kind of small by default. And then you can adjust the colors. And the VMU typically only displays in your visible game area. So if you have like a HUD or something that you still need to kind of be able to see, you could set the transparency of that VMU screen here. So something like 50%. And then you could do the same things for VMU 2, VMU 3, and VMU 4. But once you have all of your options set the way you want, if you have options that you want to set for some games but not others, you could go up to Manage Core Options and save them as a Game Options file, so that way it only applies to that single game. Now one last thing I want to show off here is shaders. If you're like me and kind of like that accurate CRT era look, you can go into the shaders, enable them, and then load up a CRT type preset. So some of my favorites include Easy Mode, um... Growing on the CRT Royal look for Gen 6 stuff in particular, I think it looks really nice. Inside the presets folder, there's other ones uh, like CRT Guest, Dr. Venom, but just gives you a nice look overall, and I really like it. So, shaders are always going to be something that's personal preference, so find one that you enjoy, and just use it to your heart's content. But once you have a shader set the way you like it, you can head back into the shader tab, click on this save button, and you can save it as a core preset or a game preset, just depending on what you're looking for. But that's going to do it as far as Dreamcast emulation is concerned on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. Thanks to the recent improvements and the addition of the Direct 3D 11 renderer, Dreamcast emulation on Xbox is just freaking awesome and just a ton of fun to mess around with. But as always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comment section below and I will do my best to try to help you out. But now if you could all do me a number of favors here at the end of the video, if you haven't already, be sure to hit that thumbs up, thumbs down button, just depending on how much you like today's tutorial. And if you haven't already, hit that sub button and bell so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. Tons of content coming your way and I'd love to have you along for the ride. For those of you interested in helping further support the channel, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. A simple dollar a month makes the biggest of differences in keeping this channel running and I cannot thank all of our current champions enough for all their ongoing support. Y'all are freaking rock stars. But until next time my wonderful internet peeps, y'all stay awesome, keep on gaming, and we'll see you back next video.